Hello, this is Professor Gillamette again, and I want to talk to you today about confidence intervals for proportions, okay? So, um, what is it? What is a confidence interval? Well, a confidence interval is a range of values with a lower limit and an upper limit in which we expect to find the actual proportion of our trait in a population, okay? Uh, I guess in the future I'll do confidence intervals for means, but today I really want to talk about um, proportions, okay? So this is the actual proportion of a trait we are looking at in the population. How does it work? Well, we only actually need three steps to make it work, all right? So during this video, I will stop during the steps to explain why we are doing certain things um, and simply define others, okay? So this is the objective for the video, all right? So uh, what's the first step? The first step is to check the assumptions. So just like in hypothesis testing, we can only use the normal model if we have a reasonable expectation that the central limit theorem is making our sampling distribution normal, right? So to meet that expectation, I need to check the four assumptions. And the four assumptions are, oh no, I grabbed something I shouldn't have. Uh, the four assumptions are independence, uh, randomness, the 10% of the population condition, um, and I just actually use the simplification that 10 times n is just less than the population. That shouldn't say p, that should say population. Nice thing about being able to do things on the fly. Uh, and then our sample size condition, which is our 10 successes and our 10 failures. Right? Um, a more detailed explanation of this is in the hypothesis test video if you have forgotten, but I just wanted to state them here, okay? So what is step number two? Uh, step two is the calculations, okay? If this all seems very familiar to the hypothesis test, it should, okay? We are basically omitting the statement of the hypothesis, but doing everything else. So now we're doing a confidence interval because we don't know what the value of the population proportion is when the sample was taken, all right? So we don't know the value of the population proportion. All we know is the sample value, all right? So maybe we have determined it has changed because we rejected the null hypothesis. Uh, in an earlier video, we saw um, that we did reject the null hypothesis, and so that wasn't the true value. So what's the, what's the new value? You know, I don't know. Uh, or maybe this is something new uh, for which we are collecting exploratory data. Maybe we don't have any baseline data. Maybe we don't know what the population proportion is because it's a new drug or a new trait that we're measuring. Um, maybe it's a new way of measuring something and so we're trying to get a baseline. Um, in any case, we can only use our sample proportion, right? Our p hat. Uh, however, if we have actually met our assumptions, then the central limit says that the most frequent value of samples will be the actual population proportion, all right? And we saw that in our uh, central limit theorem uh, video, right? The most frequent sample value is going to be the actual population proportion. And then they're gonna vary around that, okay? And the samples will become rarer as we move away from that value, all right? Which is, what we see in the normal model. In fact, it will follow the empirical rule, also known as the 6895-99.7 rule, if the central limit theorem is kicking in, okay? So what happens is, is if we take a whole bunch of samples, let's say we take uh, a bunch of samples where P is actually equal to 0.3. Now, I don't know that, all right? and I take sample size of 30, okay? Um, and so I'm gonna reach out two standard deviations to the left and the right of each sample of size 30, all right? And so what happens is, here is a sample down here at the bottom, and if I reach out two standard deviations, I actually fell close enough, all right, to the um, sample proportion. Here's more. Right? These are all falling very close or on top of the actual p-value of 0.3. In fact, we, we see that 96 out of 100 of them 
are within two standard deviations of the mean. There's only four of them that fall further away uh, than that population proportion. I said mean, I meant population proportion. And so these guys right here, uh, um, and that's what we would expect. Uh, in fact, we see that these samples fall within two standard deviations 96 out of 100 times. And we actually expect them to fall within only 95 out of 100 times. Why? Well, because it's 95%, right? Because two standard deviations contains 95% of samples according to the empirical rule. And so we would expect 95 out of 100 to be within two standard deviations and 5 out of 100 to be further away. So now, to be more confident we would need wider intervals. To grab those other four guys, we would need to make it three or four standard deviations that we were reaching out. Um, however, a confidence interval is a balancing act between how confident you want to be and how precise an interval you need to tell you something meaningful. If you start going out four standard deviations and your interval is from 1% to 99%, um, that doesn't that's not helpful information. That's not information that you can make a decision on. To illustrate this, let us use an example. All right, You are researching a new medicine. Uh, you give the medication to an appropriate population that is sick. Um, if it's an anxiety drug, uh, then these are people with anxiety. Uh, if it's a cancer drug, then these are people with a certain type of cancer. Um, the results show that 30% of individuals show improvements in symptoms. Uh, smaller growth, uh, smaller growth rate, uh, less anxiety, less depression, um, maybe uh, they journal and in their journal they're able to interact better with people, you know, or go outside more. Um, however, we know that if we do another experiment, we're going to attain a different percentage, right? It's not going to be 30%. It's just the results from this one sample show 30% of individuals showing improvement. So the 30% is our best guess, but it's only a guess, right? In fact, we cannot state the actual population proportion is this value because samples vary, right? It, it, it could be it could be that it is exactly the right P. It could be that it's a little ways away. It could be that it was pretty far away but still within two standard deviations. So I can't say that it's exactly 30% because I know that the samples are going to vary around that 30%, right? Um, so what we need is an interval. An, a range of values that tell us where we can expect the results to lie you know and so now if we want to be a hundred percent confident in our answer then it would end up with an interval uh, from that says form that's terrible uh, from zero percent to one hundred percent effective well if it's zero percent effective I'm not gonna prescribe it if it's a hundred percent effective it's the only thing I'm going to prescribe um, but do I not prescribe it or do I prescribe it all the time? I mean, it is true that the effectiveness of the treatment is between these two values, but it doesn't actually help us make a decision about whether it should be prescribed, whether it actually really helps people, whether it's worth the side effects. So we compromise and we use two standard deviations and 95% is our gold standard for balancing confidence and precision in our intervals. For certain circumstances, you may need to be more confident, 98, 99% confident, you know, especially if there's some really bad side effects or the potential to do harm uh, with something. Um, maybe you only need 90% confidence. Maybe precision is much more important um, like in an educational setting or if you're checking demographics or something, right? Uh, maybe it's more important to uh, know more precisely the number of people who may apply for food stamps so that you can plan than it is to have a large confidence in the percentage of people applying for food stamps, right? Because that's not going to do 
harm, but that is a budget issue. That's something that you need some precision with. Okay? The margin of error. Uh, what we have been discussing is the margin of error. All right, and how wide the interval becomes is due to the margin of error. 99% uh, larger margin of error. 90% uh, smaller margin of error. Uh, it has the following calculation. So the margin of error is equal to the critical z-score times our standard error, right? Where the z star is our critical z-score that gives the appropriate confidence interval, okay? So this sets how wide we're going to be reaching um, and tells us how confident we are. Now, if you're doing a rough calculation, then uh, z star of 2 is fine, um, for 95% confidence. However, the precise score is a little different. And so what I want to do is bring up my normal calculator and I created this graphic in StatCrunch. Um, and so I can see that from negative 1.960 to positive 1.960 contains 0.950042 um, probability. So all of these values. And so what we can see is that 1.960 is a better estimate of 95% of the data than our uh, 2 is, okay? Now, some other common values. Uh, certainly you can calculate these with a TI calculator or StatCrunch, um, but they're in a lot of T tables, Z tables and stuff. And so a lot of times these are just given in the stats class. And so depending on the confidence that you want, here are the different uh, z-scores, okay? Um, take, take a screenshot if you want, save it in your phone. But basically, these are going to be on z-tables uh, and t-tables, all right? Uh, the other part of is a calculation we've seen before with our hypothesis testing. Uh, yet, because we don't have the actual value of the population proportion and only the sample proportion, it's got a new name. We're going to call this the standard error of our sample proportions. Um, and this is because we're using p hat. And because p hat is an estimate, there is some error. It's not the exact deviation. Okay, And so this is the standard error of the sample proportion. And this distinguishes itself from the standard deviation of the population uh, we know uh, with p. Okay, These are all the only calculations we need to create our confidence interval. Uh, the final formula is given with the margin of error. And so uh, p hat minus the margin of error and p hat plus the mar margin of error is going to give us an interval. And this is an interval notation. All right. Um, or we could do it with the standard error calculation. And so that's our p hat plus or minus our z critical uh, times our standard error formula. Okay. Uh, again, and then the plus here. And so that gives us an interval. Again, it may be instructive to go back to our treatment experiment and do the calculations. In our trial, we had 50 participants and 15 showed improvements in symptoms. All right, so uh, without doing the assumptions, this gives us a sample proportion of the 0 0.30 and a sample size of 50. So if we want to be 95% confident, then we're going to use the critical Z value of 1.960. And I'm going to plug this in and we get this right here, right? So this is our P hat 0 0.30 minus our Z critical score of 1.960. Here's again our P hat, 1 minus P hat, all over our sample size of 50. And then uh, the plus, right? So it's the same thing. And so here, I just simplify the standard error right? And so make note, this is actually our margin of error, right? Because this is the z-score times our standard error. So uh, note the 1.27 is the margin of error. And our final uh, interval is from 17% to 43%. And so this can actually be done in a TI calculator. And it's also very easily done in StatCrunch. And so uh, this is the output that I got. And you can see that it gives very similar results, and that makes us very happy, right? So there's my 17%, and there's my 42% in the upper limit, all right? And so now we're ready for step three, the conclusion, right? So now that we have an interval, we can state what it means. 
And so we are some number percent confident that the true proportion of the population with this trait is between the lower value that we got and the upper value. So if we want to put this in terms of the experiment uh, that we just did above, we would say we are 95% confident that the true proportion of patients receiving this treatment who experience reduced symptoms is between the 0.17 and the 0.42, right? So depending on side effects, right, if the side effects aren't very bad uh, and the effectiveness of other treatments, right, um, if other treatments are only 10% effective and we have a minimum of 17% effective, then this would be uh, might mean we could recommend it. Um, if other treatments have an effective rate that's maybe closer to 50%, which is above our upper limit, maybe we don't recommend it. So all of that actually depends on further analysis. You'll learn in your discipline and as you conduct your own research study, right? As you do your own research. So this concludes the how and why of confidence intervals, and you should be able to perform this inferential test, and that makes us happy. So in the next video, I'm going to do an example, just start to finish uh, with the narrative and just following the steps, and I bet that makes you happy too.